Hello everyone. I'm Parvez Hudbhai here in Islamabad and it is my pleasure to invite you to the very first lecture of Afghar e Taza, ThinkFest. This lecture is by Nargis Mawalwala, Professor of Physics at MIT. She's also the Dean of the School of Sciences. And best of all, she is Pakistani. She was born in Karachi, went to the Convent of Jesus and Mary's, and then went to Wellesley College in, Boston, in Massachusetts, and then did her PhD. And she's done marvelous work in the detection of gravitational waves, as well as other parts of physics, including cooling down systems to incredibly low temperatures, and also trying to beat the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So it's my pleasure to invite her. Nargis, would you start? Great, so th thank you so much, Pervez, and, and thank you, uh, Yakub, for having me here. Um, so th I thought what I would do is I'd spend a, a few minutes with, a, uh, with some colorful slides to tell you um, the story uh, of the discovery of gravitational waves. And then what we do is we would uh, just follow up with a conversation uh, with you, Pervez. I'm sure you'll ask me provocative questions, as you always do. So, uh, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, and share my screen, and you would just let me know if that's um, uh, if that's working. Um, so, uh, hi everybody. Uh, so, as I promised, I would tell you a little bit about the story of the discovery of gravitational waves. Uh, and and the, the truth is, if you don't really uh, know about gravitational waves or or don't really know why you should care, uh, the story should uh, should say something about them. So, what? this story is about is really about a completely new way of looking out into the universe. And when we talk about opening a new window into the universe, we first have to say, you know, what was the old window? And the old window was light. So when we look out at the stars and we look at the galaxies that, that, that stars make up, much of that information comes to us from very uh, from different colors of light and a huge range of colors of light, but that's where we, we get. Now, if you wanted to look at dark objects, then you kind of have to do something a little bit, uh, a little bit different. You have to use some other means of, of uh, you have to use some other means of uh, uh, looking. And typically that would be to look at the gravity of, uh, Good. So typically you look at the gravity uh, of stars. So let's look at that uh, of, of objects that are emitting these, these stars. So let's look at what that, that means. So this discovery that I'm gonna talk about won the Nobel Prize in, in, in 2017, the Nobel Prize in Physics. And it was for a discovery that shook the world. And this is a wonderful metaphor because what gravitational waves do they are the waves of gravity. What they do is they literally come by and jitter us a little bit. They shake the distances between objects and the discovery uh, was made by measuring those distances with great precision. And it was done by these three founding fathers, uh, Ray Weiss, who was my PhD advisor uh, at MIT and uh, Kip Thorne and Barry Barish at uh, Caltech, who were my postdoc advisors. So I've been involved in this field for quite a while, as you can tell. Now, the gravitational waves are really, um, are really um, ripples of this fabric of space-time itself. So if you look at the little picture on the left, it shows, it shows um, uh, what happens to space-time if you put a massive object in that. You can think of space-time, you know, you always think of empty space as totally empty. Well, I'm gonna tell you, it, it, it's not, neither totally empty, nor does it just sit around. It can actually warp, it can ripple, it can even Tear. So space-time ripples are gravitational waves, and they're typically emitted when massive objects like two stars, in particular very massive objects like black holes, when they orbit each other, they, these waves are sent out at ripples uh, on the space-time itself. So the history of these waves are that 
Einstein, Albert Einstein in 1916 was the first person to propose these theoretically. And, and he actually dismissed them in his 1916 paper as something that's impossible to, to detect and so they'll never be useful. Um, then the clock ticks for many decades and in the 1960s and 70s with the discovery of black holes and, and neutron stars, which are the lighter cousins of black holes, uh, Kip Horn on, uh, you know, at Caltech was a theorist and started to think about what kind of emission would these objects, like neutron stars and black holes, what kind of gravitational emission could they give? And he agreed with Einstein's original uh, ideas that they would be pretty faint. And in fact, they would have an amplitude that's a part in 10 to the 21. So that's a, a decimal point with 20 zeros after it before you put a one. At the same time, also in the late 1960s and 70s, Ray Weiss uh, on the right here, who's an experimentalist, was starting to think about how we might actually detect them. And he kind of concluded that you should be able to detect them if you can measure tiny changes in distances. And the tiny, by tiny, we mean about a thousandth the size of a, uh, of a single proton, so 10 to the minus 18 meters. And he understood that to do that, you needed very large detectors because the longer your detector, the bigger the signal would be. Kip Thorne and Ray Weiss met in 1975 and that led to the, for the invention of a large network of detectors in the United States. There were the LIGO detectors there in Washington state and in Louisiana. Uh, they're four kilometers long in Europe, there's a three kilometer detector called Virgo. And then there's an, a patchwork of other detectors that are under construction uh, or operational, uh, in, uh, you know, including a planned detector in, in India uh, and an, an upcoming uh, three kilometer detector in Japan called Kagra. Uh, so that, those, that network of detector took something like 25 years to build from the time that Horn and, 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 and Weiss had the idea that this should be done, uh, was funded over many decades by, uh, by the National Science Foundation in the US. Uh, and eventually, another uh, 15 years later, so in 2015, so on September 14, 2015, there was a remarkable signal. The first signal for gravitational waves were captured by these detectors. And that's what this plot here shows. So I wanna just spend a few minutes. The, the, it signal tells us that these are two black holes that are colliding. And on the vertical axis is the actual amplitude of the wave. It's, it's got units of strain because it's change in length per length. And I just want to point you to, to how this iconic picture for a couple of, of, of reasons. The first is that these bumps and wiggles that you see in, before your screen, these are literally the changes in amplitude as a function of time of space time itself we are seeing the ripples of space time as they pass through the LIGO detectors. The second thing you see is that there are two plot, uh, curves here, and those are actually time shifted by about seven milliseconds. And this difference in the, in, in the timing of the waves coming to the two detectors in two different locations in the United States told us about where in the sky these objects are located. And then finally, from looking at the, at the height of the signal, we can tell a lot of, about the properties of the wave, uh, of the source, including the mass of the black holes, how far they were, et cetera. And so at the maximum of, of, the, of, of the signal, the wave, the gravitational wave that we measured had an amplitude of 10 to the minus 21. And it's a big check mark for Kip Thorne. He told us in the late 1960s that this would be the case. That, and then the actual motion of the mirrors of, of the detector of LIGO uh, was about, uh, a few times 10 to the minus 18 meters. And that's a big check mark for Ray Weiss. He told us in 1972 that this was possible to do and told us how to do it. And then, you know, my generation of scientists who were his students were part of the team that built these detectors, but these ideas originated uh, with him. So if you can also take these signals and turn them into a, a, a movie. Um, and so I do have to go in, uh, I'll just play the movie from here. Uh, and what you'll see in this movie is it, it is, okay, you can't really do this in this way since I'm not able to go to 
let me try presenter mode. And if you can see just part of the screen, I hope you'll still be able to see the movie. So the movie is really showing two black holes orbiting each other. And what you see is they're placed artificially in this case in a field of stars. And you can see how the light from the stars is distorting, just as if you were stirring you know, cream into a coffee cup. You can see uh, that's the gravity of these black holes pulling all the objects around them and the light being distorted as, as such. Now, what you can tell from the, from, the, uh, from the signal was these black holes were, were uh, a, a certain distance away. They were 1.3 billion light years away. They uh, weighed 30 times the mass of our sun. And this is now a really remarkable thing. You really have to hold on to your seats to, to know this. They, these black holes, were moving at half the speed of light when they collided. So you have to just imagine Bendis, you can, in your- You can keep the full screen. Oh, it's, it's working fine. now? Oh, yeah. good. All right, much better. So now I can actually show you the, the movie. You can see that the black holes, will, will they'll be swirling around each, each other. And eventually what happens is they lose energy to, because gravitational waves are being emitted. And because they lose energy, that orbit shrinks. And they're, eventually their orbits shrink so much that they collide with each other. And that's that big burst of gravitational waves that we eventually measured in our detectors. And a new black hole is formed. The other thing that we learned is that this new black hole was, was actually three solar masses lighter than the co combination of the two parents. And, uh, and that was that an indication that three times the mass of our, our sun was emitted away as gravitational wave energy in those uh, in that fraction of a second in the last you know 200 milliseconds before these uh, black holes collide. It's a very very violent system. We also know that the two black holes did not live happily ever after. They collided, but they formed this new black hole. Now that's the story. Or that's the first discovery, and this is what the Nobel Prize for was for. Uh, but then I told you we're really opening a window into the universe, and so a window would mean a way of seeing many things. And so the next really exciting uh, signal for us came in 2017, in September on uh, on uh, August 17, uh, 2017. And what you see here on the bottom in this curved graphic is the gravitational wave signal and look, the time scale on it is much longer than anything the black hole could do. Remember the black hole signal I showed you was a fraction of a second and here is now a signal that's lasting over a minute. And that immediately told us that this was a much lighter object than those, those heavy black holes and therefore likely to be a neutron star. Now, neutron stars are the lighter cousins of black holes, but they have another very important property, which is they're made of neutrons. And when neutron stars collide, they should give off an enormous and copious amount of, uh, of light as well, in all different colors of light. And indeed, about 1.7 seconds after LIGO saw this neutron star gravitational waves from the neutron star collision, we actually observed a gamma ray telescope observed a signal in gamma rays. And this was really exciting. And because I've told you, because those bumps and wiggles uh, that we measure in LIGO tell us about the location of the object, we were able to tell all of our astronomer friends to go out and look for this neutron star collision. We could localize it and we could tell that it was actually localized in the Southern hemisphere. Now, at the time that LIGO saw the signal, it was daytime in the Southern Hemisphere. So astronomers had roughly 12 hours to prepare their telescopes to point in that patch of sky and look for this, what should be a brand new object. Because when the neutron stars were far apart and orbiting each other, they give off no light, you can see nothing. And now when they collide, there should be this spectacular fireworks of light. And indeed, there was, this is a busy slide. The only thing I want you to notice is at the ver at that in every frequency band that we looked with telescopes, we saw something. And the, what did we see is the most interesting thing. If you look down at the at the at the at the bottom here, um, at at say um, at this curve here, uh, DLT40 is a telescope, and this is looking at a galaxy. It's a particular galaxy. It's NGC 4993. That's not important. What's important is to see that. Every one of these telescopes in this crosshairs sees a little dot. 
Now, if you look at the same field of view from the same telescope 20 days earlier, there is nothing in, in, in that crosshair. So this is a brand new object that lit up in the sky that night. And now, because we had all these different array of telescopes with all different colors, you could actually see this is a nice, a nice uh, movie of what happened when initially only gravitational waves are radiated. And then eventually, as the neutron stars collide, you can see these jets of light, all different colors of light. The, B, the jets are gamma rays, and then all of this debris gives off all different colors of light. And you can see the colors are changing with time. Initially, it, there's, it's very energetic. And then as the energy, you know, as the photons cool down, you get to, to less energetic uh, um, objects. So because you can measure all those colors of light, which is, and you can see which colors of light are, are most visible, uh, you know, how many days, in a, a few days after the collision. This is just showing a time series. All these different bumps in these spectra are indicators of the formation of elements of the periodic table. So this is one of the most amazing stories of, 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 an, of an unexpected discovery. For a long time, we have known that here on the earth, we have too much gold. Now you might be really puzzled, too much gold. I mean, gold is a precious metal, it's rare. You know, entire civilizations have been, you know, lost and won over gold. How can I say something as absurd as we have too much gold? But it turns out, in terms of the geological history of planet Earth, we have too much gold because gold and heavy elements, you know, like like platinum, gold, they have they need many neutrons in their nuclei to to form these elements, and the elements that are formed in the sun, the sun does not have. Uh, the, uh, enough energy to form these elements. So we always think, you know, we are all the elements that were made of are formed in, in our sun, and that's how the solar system was formed. And that isn't really quite true once you get to the heavier elements. And we've not known where these heavy elements come from. Some are formed in the explosions of stars called supernovae, but the, even that doesn't have enough neutrons to produce these really heavy elements. Now, an environment where you could have enough neutrons is, of course, neutron stars. And so these curves that we see, these bumps that we see in the spectra, showed us in real time nature's factory for gold. We saw gold being formed, and we now can say with some certainty that not only are we here on planet Earth made of stardust, but we're also made of neutron stardust. And that was the, the story of that discovery. Now, these gravitational detectors in the meantime have been making many other discoveries. There are more than 70 sources have been detected and we're continuously working to improve these detectors because there are many mysterious objects we're discovering and uh, pervades, uh, uh, mentioned earlier that some of my work is in, in, in quantum physics, and that's part of what, what I do is I, I use the concepts of quantum physics to make improvements to these detectors so we can see fainter objects uh, farther uh, away. Um, so I want to sort of highlight the moment that we're witnessing. The moment we're witnessing here is, so what have we done with these, these discoveries? Well, we've made the first direct observations of gravitational waves. Einstein told us a hundred, little over a hundred years ago that these should exist. And it took us roughly those hundred years to actually detect them because they're so darn faint. By detecting them, we have confirmed another uh, part of Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity, which is the, the theory that underlies you know, the prediction of these gravitational waves. We've seen for the first time, we've seen black holes and neutron stars in, that occur in pairs and we've watched them collide in real time. Those, that's, those are what, that's what our signals show us. And then as, as for me personally, as someone who spent my entire uh, you know, career uh, building these, these instruments, it's also an in, incredible um, relief that the, the, the darn machine works. And it works at the sub-atometer precision that we needed and, and continuously improving. Now, these are wonderful things, but you know, when people look back, when historians of science look back at this moment in time, say a hundred years from now, this is not what they will re remember. What they will remember or what they will recount is really that we have 
turned on a completely new way in which to study the universe. We can now for the first time use gravity instead of light. And that's really the moment to, 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 to celebrate that, uh, that there are unimagined new discoveries that are waiting for us because we have found a completely new way to look out into the universe. So, you know, I'm going to, that is sort of the, the end of what I wanted to say as, as sort of my, uh, you know, the story of the discovery. Now, I've noticed when I, when I, uh, when I give talks, um, a little puzzling to me. Uh, I, I enjoy solving the puzzles of nature, uh, but there's also the puzzles of human nature. I have noted, uh, noted that uh, people are often very interested in my own personal journey. So I thought I would say a, a, a few words uh, 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 about that. Uh, it, and, and so if you indulge me uh, with that. So, so my, my journey, as Pervez mentioned, began in Pakistan. I, 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 I grew up in Karachi. I went to the convent of Jesus and Mary. And there I had a, a, a chemistry teacher who was very, um, uh, was very generous in allowing me uh, uh, to experiment in the lab after hours and, you know, and was not, um, was not uh, timid about explosions and stink bombs. And this was a very inspiring for, for a young uh, kid, you know, uh, uh, looking to, ma uh, to make a life in science. I also uh, uh, learned very early on uh, to repair bicycles. And these two things have, you know, carried me into a lab when I went to college. And I had my first experience of, of, of living in a lab and, and doing research and asking questions that no one knew the, the answer to uh, when I was in college at, at Wellesley. Um, then I started graduate school at MIT in 1990, and that's when I met Ray Weiss. And at that, at that time, it was quite by accident. And at that time, I thought I had really, I, I really thought he was, uh, he was insane because he told me about the idea of, of LIGO. And he told me that we had to make a measurement that was, it had the precision that was 1,000 times smaller than a single proton. And I just thought that was impossible to do, but then I couldn't get it out of my mind. I understood that if we could, if we succeeded in doing this, there would be an enormous pay, payoff in that we would have opened this new window into the universe. So in 1991, I joined Ray Weiss's group as a graduate student. Then I had some, you know, uncertainty about whether I wanted to be a physicist or a lawyer and, you know, uh, uh, but then again, you know, the importance of mentorship, you know, uh, many um, uh, mentors uh, and, and my love of science came to the rescue. And this is a, fi a picture uh, of, of me uh, uh, in, the, in the late, uh, mid to late 1990s, um, uh, working at the observatory, at the LIGO observatories when they were first being built. So there I am, and I, I'm always in, that was my, my work uniform. I always wore a hat and I always wore cargo pants with pockets filled with tools and, and electronic uh, 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 devices and measurement e equipment. Um, then I went to MIT as a faculty member in 2002. And this is a photo of me working with one of my first graduate students when, uh, when I was there still with the hat and the cargo pants um, uh, in the lab. Um, and, and eventually, uh, you know, I had a lot of recognition in my own, own career. And of course, ultimately, uh, and I always like to encourage, uh, you know, acknowledge that this was really the work I did with many, many students and, and, and colleagues. Um, and then, of course, there was the discovery of a lifetime. This is me uh, hugging Ray Weiss on the morning that his Nobel Prize was, uh, uh, was announced. And then I always like to add that I also uh, have, uh, have managed, which is sometimes seen as not possible, and I would argue it is very possible. I have managed to combine my, my love of science and my career uh, uh, with, uh, with the family. So this is a photo of, of Ray Weiss uh, building uh, something in the machine shop with, with, my, uh, with my older son who, when he was pretty little then. He's now 12. Um, so that's my story. Um, this is a picture of me in Ray Weiss's lab in 1993. There is me standing over, over there. That's Ray Weiss and a uh, no, number of our group members. Uh, a similar picture taken in 2015. And you can see there is me again and there is Ray. And some of the people from those initial pictures are still around. This is one of the things that, that, that's very important in, in a discovery like this that takes many decades, that Ray was very inspirational. And many of the people who started as students in his group really stayed in the field and continued working on this. Um, 
here is a picture of me in, 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 my, in my lab in 2014, uh, um, I think this was. And this is me doing the gravitational wave dance with uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson of the film series uh, Cosmos. And then finally, I'll, uh, you know, I, this is a picture that combines my professional and, and, and personal life. This is a photo uh, captured by a photographer on the morning of the pre at, at the press conference where we announced the LIGO discovery. And my son was sitting in the front row and he was bored. And so this was a, per a private moment where I was just, uh, I said, I was pointing at him and saying, I got you kid. And I really like it because it sort of combines my, my two passions together in, in one snapshot. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, there was a Nobel prize and we got to, to, uh, uh, to go to Stockholm to, to celebrate this, uh, this achievement. Um, so I will stop here. I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen and I'll be very happy to, to pervase to, <laughs> to have a chat. So thank you. Oh boy, what a terrific presentation that was. I loved it. Thank you. And you just, uh, just, you, you just scrape the surface because there's so much you could have told us about uh, gravitational lensing. Now that's a whole new area of, of astronomy that's opened up because of the discovery of gravitational waves, because as these waves go past any heavy object, they bend and we're able to see now dark matter through gravitational waves. Who could have thought that that would have been a possibility? Lovely. But um, I guess I have a lot to talk to you about. But first, I have a sure. quibble. All yeah, right? I do quibble. All right. You said that this proved Einstein's general theory of relativity. No, it didn't. Look, um, general relativity, uh, yeah, um, okay, it's consistent with that. But um, we're not at strong enough gravitational fields to be able to say that this is the theory of gravity. So uh, that, that's a quibble. You agree? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah I do. I, I'll, I'll, I'll qualify that. So, you know, so general relativity has been proved in many other ways, including famously, it is the reason our GPS is as precise as, as it is. But there was a part of, of, of the theory of general relativity that was that no one had been able to really uh, test before. And that is, does space time really ripple? Because all of the tests of general relativity that we have had so far were in our own solar system, in our own near our own Earth Sun system, and those systems don't radiate waves. They do curve space time, and that space time curvature and the and all of those effects were there. So this was really the first time we saw the the time dependent part of the theory. Now, what you say is also correct. Are there other theories that also could explain this alternative theories of gravity? I would say they are, and they are increasingly because of the growing precision of our measurements. They are increasingly on weaker and weaker footing. Yeah. So basically, one can test what is called weak gravity theory this way. And also, we're not seeing over here the interference of gravitational waves with themselves. That's another field that at some time, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to access. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, um, Nargis, what's the future in this? Look, I, I, I want to come to your personal journey in, in a bit, but uh, since we don't have a whole lot of time, how do you see this field developing in the immediate future of it going into space, of um, there being um, those uh, three uh, satellites far away communicating with each other, looking for small ripples in space time? Yeah. Are you involved so, in that? Uh, Are you, you know, person? No, sort of distantly as, 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 a, as, as a scientific colleague, there is some technology exchanges that are possible between these ideas. So that what, what, you're, what you're referring to is, is, an, is a, a, a project called LISA, that's the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, and it's a space version of a gravitational wave detector. Uh, and the, the way that this works is there are, it's a triangle, and at each point of the triangle, is a spacecraft, and these spacecraft are space. The, the, the length of the side of the triangle is uh, is uh, uh, about five million kilometers. So, because you have these large distances, you can make a measurement that doesn't need as much precision, which is necessary in, for for a space. Uh, uh, mission because if you try to achieve the precision of of LIGO in space, we don't have the technical know how to do that. So. 
the the first question you can ask is, well, why? Why do you want to put a detector out in space? You already have LIGO and Virgo and others working here on the Earth. And the reason is that there are some objects that emit gravitational waves that are that are at much lower frequencies. So they're very slowly orbiting each other, like supermassive black holes. And here on the Earth, if you want to measure a gravitational wave that's sort of going at a at a frequency lower than a few hertz, so if it's if it's going anything slower than a few times per second, all the other vibrations of the Earth get in the way. We don't we just can't make the measurement. It, we don't you know. And so if you want to make a measurement of these lower frequency gravitational waves, you have to get off the Earth, and that's why you have something like LISA that will. It, it's a, it's the, the best analogy is when you think about having an optical telescope and then you have a radio telescope, right? So radio telescopes look at much lower frequency light waves and that's the, the analogy. So that's, the, that, that's, okay, so what's the story with LISA? LISA is a joint uh, European Space Agency and NASA project. It has a launch date of 2034, which when they first announced the launch date sounded impossibly far away and now it's just at the mere, you know, <laughs> 13 years away. Um, good. So, so that, of, just... of, your, of your 70 sources, you said uh, 70 events have been so far uh, yeah. seen. Has any of them been a supernova event? Because no. you ought to get gravitational waves out of supernova as well. Supernova, as you explained earlier, are these massive stars which explode and which have created all the heavy elements, the stuff that you and I are made of. So, um, any yes. Of them, no. So, so the supernovae should give off gravitational waves, uh, but they're a relatively weak source of gravitational waves. So, for us to see a supernova, we would it would have to be in our own galaxy, and we know that typical rate of supernovae in galaxies is about one per hundred years. So, it's statistically we have to wait a hundred years to see one. And, and so unlikely. Was 1987, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that was the, the last one. So, you know, so I think it's a rare event for us. It's not impossible. And, you know, these are Poisson distributed. So in principle, just because there was one in 1987 doesn't mean there couldn't be one, you know, tomorrow. Uh, but we have not seen something that would that looks like that. It's It's a rare event. And so that's consistent with what we expect. Okay, now there's a question I'm dying to ask. Mm -hmm. What about the gravitational waves from the Big Bang itself? Oh, um, my goodness. Do uh, not get me started on, on, no, on no, that. No, I, know you can, I know you can't do that. But uh, no. I, just, I just read something in physics today that um, they're looking at pulsars in our galaxy. And they're looking to see what happens when a, when a wave of that frequency, that which would be emitted from the time of the Big Bang, passes through and wobbles space-time. So yeah. um, that's a lovely yeah. idea, don't you think? Oh, I do. I do. And I think it, it's very, it has every likelihood of succeeding. But let me just go back to your original thing, the you know, gravitational waves from the early universe. So first of all, why did I say don't get me started on that? Because um, whilst they are really, really faint and too faint for to be detected by our current uh, you know, uh, gra uh, LIGO technologies, the, the science behind them is just fantastically beautiful. So what is the story of the birth of the universe? The story of the birth of the universe is that the universe was born out of the Big Bang, and then it was in a tiny little volume, and then it expanded exponentially. That's the story we have from observations of light and particles. Now, what part of that story is that photons, which is the light that we see, for, uh, are, are were, are extremely friendly particles. They love to interact with each other. They, they scatter off matter, they, they reflect, they refract. Uh, and so when the universe was really young, hot and dense, the photons were trapped. They just kept bouncing between the electrons and they never escaped, they never streamed out. The gravitational waves on the other hand are extremely aloof. They don't interact with matter, they don't interact with each other. So these gravitational waves have been streaming have been free to propagate since the earliest moments after the Big Bang, whilst the photons did not propagate until the universe was 400,000 years old. So if we want to see the earliest moments of the birth of the universe, light cannot do it. Light did not stream. 
Uh, but gravitational waves were streaming from the very beginning. And so if we could measure those early uh, uh, universe gravitational waves, we go look all the way back to the Big Bang, which light cannot do, light has shrouded. So that's the reason to do it. Now you ask about the pulsars, these are actually, it's a beautiful experiment. So pulsars are neutron stars that are spinning and they have an extremely precise rate at which they spin. So you can think of them as very precise clocks. Now, if a gravitational wave comes by, it perturbs that clock signal. And by looking at small changes in the timing of the clock signal, you can infer the gravitational wave. And that's what these experiments are trying to do. And they're trying to do them with, uh, with waves that have the right wavelength or time scale that are consistent with waves from the early universe. And that would be the way to look back into the, into the very, I mean, you know, it gives me goosebumps to think about, to look back at the very birth of the universe, of at least of our universe. Absolutely fascinating. Oh, it's, it's, it's such a great time to be in physics and particularly in astrophysics and cosmology, because with all this experimental information coming in, earlier on, we had mathematical models, but you didn't know which one was right. Okay, now there are lots and lots of things that I can have to ask you, and I'd love to keep talking about, but let's go to your personal journey. But before that, a bit about my personal journey, because when I came to MIT in 1969, I went looking for a freshman advisor. And guess who I went to? Ray Weiss. Weiss. <laughs> yeah. I love it. <laughs> I went to him and I said, um, I'm just all right, uh, can you give me something nice to think about? He said, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, why don't you think about a superconductive a superconductor that's rotating and in orbit around the earth? How would it precess? Oh, I said, I never went back to him again. <laughs> but, well, I was 19 and you were uh, 35 when, or 30 when you... Uh, when I met him, no, I was 22. 20, uh, I, huh? 22? Yeah, I met him right, right after I graduated from college, so... Okay, okay. Uh, well, he's very inspirational. Now, tell me, uh, Nargis, you were in uh, Jesus and Mary's and you had a teacher over there who inspired you and you had considerable freedom to think about things. This is the way how, um, how, how students are nurtured, how their interest in science is nurtured. Do you, how, how do you propose that we get more people like you, particularly more women like you, interested in science in Pakistan. And once we get them interested, what do they do? What should they do? Yeah, so, so I, I have to say, look, I'm not, first of all, I've, I've been living overseas, uh, you know, away from Pakistan for decades now. So, uh, you know, it's a little hard for me to fully understand, you know, sort of the, the facts on the ground. But I think this idea of how do we get women interested is already a little bit, um, it's not the right question to ask. We, young women, girls are interested. We all are born with curiosity. Have you ever met a baby that isn't curious? You know, and so I kind of, I, I think the right question is, is, is not how do we get women interested? How do we maintain and nurture uh, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that interest? You know, I mean, today is the, the, the international, you know, uh, Today is the International Day for Women in Science, and I think that that's a wonderful way to celebrate this question you ask for Bayes, right? Uh, so to, to me, I think really, if I think about my own journey, there's, there's you know, the, probably the most important ingredient was opportunity, right? I mean, so, you know, you, you, people can argue about how much, how much, you know, there's nature versus nature, what nurture, what was intrinsic. You can argue about all of those things, but no matter how brilliant you are without opportunity, you can't express that brilliance and impact, have impact on society. So, so for me, it, it really, it's a question of taking young kids who have in, innate curiosity and then just feeding that curiosity, letting them 
you know, for me, it was just literally, you know, being able to go to the lab after hours, you know, a chemistry lab and, you know, being able to turn on a, a Bunsen burner. And I, there was a naughty side to me. And I liked, you know, I experimented with hydrogen sulfide. I made stink bombs. And, and, and you know, this was really just, you know, for a kid, this is so exciting when you can do something like that. So I kind of feel like that's really the place where we have to, to think hard. It's not about how to get kids interested is how to nurture that interest, how to maintain it, promote it. Loosen the bonds and it's within you. It's intrinsic. Everybody wants to know how to do things and give them the opportunity. And the better ones, the best ones will make it up to the top. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, come to the present. How does it feel to be Dean of Sciences at MIT? Is it intimidating or do you just take it in your stride? Uh, a little bit of both. It's totally intimidating because of the sort of the enormity of the task. Uh, but also, uh, you know, I do take it in stride because otherwise the, the enormity of the task would paralyze me. So, um, uh, but I think it's a very important, uh, you know, when I thought about, you know, I, I mean, I have this this big research group. I, I, you know, I'm still, you know, doing, you know, producing uh, sort of good science, etc. So when I thought about, you know, stepping into the role of the dean, what motivated me to do that was really starting to think a little bit bigger than my own research and wanting to sort of be, enable others to have the opportunity to make this kind of discovery. So as a dean, what I mainly do is I'm really working to enable the work of, of my colleagues and, 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 you know, whether it's through, through funding it or, 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 you know, through all kinds of administrative uh, processes. And I find that really rewarding. I think it's, 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 it's wonderful that someone came before me that did these things for me and my generation of people. And now it's my turn to do that for the next. And so that's sort of how I think about it. So it's, it's intimidating, but it's also really rewarding. But it's, uh, it, well, it's, it's absolutely marvelous. Now I remember that was uh, maybe four or five years ago that um, we met at MIT and uh, you came to Kendall Square on your bicycle, and here you were, a professor at MIT, riding a bicycle very joyfully. And in, uh, I think it was uh, summer, so you were in your shorts and all that. So it's the free lifestyle that's so important. I wish we could have that kind of lifestyle here in Pakistan, and then we would have, we would have so many like you. In, in a population of 250 million, 220 million, at least we get 20, 200, 2,000, something like that. So how, what's your view on lifestyle and how that's important to nurturing the intellect? You know, look, I, I completely agree with, with, with you. I, I, don't, I, I don't even think it's a question of, of you would have, you know, so many thousands in Pakistan. You do have. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, versions of, of me are there. It is really a question of, of creating the circumstances where, where creativity and passion can, can, uh, can, you know, sort of rule the day, if you will. And I, I think freedom is a very important piece of, 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 of that. That was, you know, part of the motivations that, that, you know, motivated me to leave and 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 uh, and you know I that's part of my life here that I really cherish uh, you know and uh, you know just just the ability to the ability to to be a whole person you know every part of, of, of yourself can can be expressed whether it's me joyfully riding my 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 bike which i do i even you know, although you know it's snowy out so today it wasn't so joyful but uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you live a full life you enjoy it and there cannot be anything better what um... yeah. I, mean, I, I must say, I, I, I also, I also understand that it's a great privilege to have to, to to have that. Not everyone, very few, have the privilege. I tell my students sometimes, you know, if you if you if you find something that you really love to do, you will never work a day in your life. Wonderful. And Nadia, what a privilege! You, you are an inspiration for young girls in this country and for women in the United States. 
Thank so you. We've had a lovely conversation. I know that you have a meeting at um, nine o'clock. Yeah, and you're yeah. waiting to get to it. So thanks very much. It was a terrific opening lecture for ThinkFest. Thank you. It was a real pleasure to talk to you as always, Pervez. And, 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 and thank you to everybody out there who's, who's listening in as well. So uh, enjoy the rest of ThinkFest and, and, uh, and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. Good. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.